Well, hello, folks. It's good to be with you all tonight and to uh, share uh, this uh, opening message in our time together. Um, I don't know, uh, we had a little prayer meeting uh, uh, around four o'clock, and it was a good time, but prayer meetings are dangerous. Uh, in that prayer meeting, I really felt like the Lord said, before I share this, uh, I need to give a bit of a testimony. And uh, as Jerry's mentioned, uh, the group that's here that will be sharing with you folks, uh, we're part of a Zoom prayer meeting, and uh, as Jerry said, we, uh, we have opportunity a few times to get together, and we had that opportunity in Wilmore a couple of years ago. And uh, while we were there, uh, Jerry and Steve got together and uh, said, you know, we think it would be good, Mark, if you went back to uh, the FAS leadership team and kind of talk about uh, some things that had happened in the past. I don't know if you all realize, uh, I was with uh, Francis Asbury Society, as Jerry said, for five years. And then there was kind of a parting of a ways there, and, um, and Kathy and I then helped plant uh, GCF there in Wilmore, and then headed up to Minnesota to the cold north. But uh, because of that parting of a ways, there was really never an opportunity to get back together and to, in a sense, reconcile on that. So. Uh, uh, Jerry and uh, Steve kind of worked it out that we could go and meet with Ron and uh, Smith and Stan Key and uh, Jerry was there and Steve and myself and it was uh, it was just a, a great time of our coming together forgiveness said just uh, sharing I remember uh, Ron praying over me just weeping uh, before the Lord and uh, it meant so much to me and I at first, when they said, let's do this, I said, you know, I don't know if I need that. But, uh, but I realized uh, in that coming together, uh, I really did need it. And, uh, and I so appreciate that. And Ron, obviously, out of that coming together, uh, was gracious to invite uh, not only me, but this group of folks that are, uh, mean a lot to me to, to be a part of uh, this gathering. Uh, I think one of the things that taught me is that in seeking and praying for awakening and revival, uh, reconciliation is a very important thing uh, in our lives. And, and I think, in a sense, our, our group was praying for and is praying for awakening and revival. And out of that, out of that praying, I think the Lord made this happen. So it's great to be back at the Francis Asbury Society and sharing with you tonight. And um, uh, I'm grateful for what uh, God has done among us. Uh, I'm delighted. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, Ron can't be here, but we'll pray he'll, he'll get well soon and maybe be able to make the second retreat. Hey, Mark? Yes. It's a little light here. Can you, can you lean in more? Can yeah. light in and turn I'm going to, uh, John, show me how to turn this up. This way? Yes. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I'll get it a little closer too. Okay. We're good? Okay, so if you want to, uh, if you have your Bibles, you can leave it open to Acts 1 and 2. I'm going to kind of move through some verses in both of those chapters. But before we do, I want to pray and... Um, just ask the Lord to bless us in this time together. So let's pray together. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Come to the wedding of earth and heaven. Come to the feast of love. Lord, we're grateful for this great salvation that's within us. A salvation in which we can taste of the things to come. And Lord, we, uh, we give you this time here in this beautiful spot of earth. And we pray, Lord, that heaven and earth will touch in these days together. That you would meet with us. That, Lord, you would do things in us, all of us, that would surprise us. 
Lord, we're hungry for you in this hour as we've shared going around how much we need awakening and revival and renewal. And so, Lord, we pray that in our gathering here together that we may have a token of that reality uh, in our midst here. So we love you, Jesus. We thank you for this great salvation of ours. We thank you for this beautiful union with you. And that out of that union, we discovered so much of the life that you've given us. So we pray that your spirit would be among us now as we, uh, as we seek you together as your people. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. When we were up in Minnesota, a while there, there was a, a, a college of mission on the campus there. Matter of fact, Alan came up many times and shared at that college of missions. Uh, Bethany College of Missions, but there was a young lady who came as a student, and she came from a Muslim country, and uh, when she became a Jesus follower, her family not only disowned her, but they abused her, and she then began to live with some missionaries there in the area, and she felt she was being led to come to the College of Missions but to come, the Lord told her she needed to get permission from her dad, who she had not spoken to over several years because he had disowned her. And so she made contact with him, and by the grace of God, he said, yes, let's talk. And so she told him what he, she wanted to do. In the conversation, he asked her, he said, Munera, do you have hope? And she said back to him, Dad, I have hope so bright it burns my eyes. And he said, you can go. Now, we as believers, we who have life in Jesus, we have many hopes. But Paul said our blessed hope, and he says this in, in uh, Titus 2.14, he said, our blessed hope is the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus appears, obviously that is the time we will be resurrected from the dead into our new creation bodies. And Jesus will renew all things and bring heaven and earth together into a new creation where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, where God becomes all and in all. And that is our, our great hope. That's our blessed hope. So it's no wonder that when Jesus was resurrected into his new creation body, the disciples assumed that he now would launch the blessed hope out of Jerusalem. And so we'll pick up on that, uh, that point in their life, which is in Acts 1, 6 through 8. And uh, let me just read this to you. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So, they had this assumption that Jesus was going to launch the blessed hope. But Jesus says, no, it's not for you to know the time. But he says, I tell you what, I'm going to give you another hope before the blessed hope. And that hope is Holy Spirit coming on you power. Jesus says, this is the hope before the blessed hope. And... Ten days after Jesus said that, and Jesus had ascended into heaven, there was a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And it was, it was such a strong outpouring that it not only filled the individual disciples, but it brought revival to the group of disciples and even brought a, an awakening over a portion of Jerusalem. So the Spirit began to 
manifest himself in such a powerful way, this Holy Spirit coming on you power. So Holy Spirit coming on you power is our hope before the blessed hope. It is, it is the hope that we, we can experience and we can know in this particular time. And it's absolutely essential that we go after this hope before the blessed hope, this Holy Spirit coming on you power. It's essential for us as individual believers. It's essential for our churches. It's essential for, as we've said, our nation. That we're, we're, we're seeking God for this, this hope that Jesus said the disciples could enter into. Now, tonight I want to share with you why it's so essential. And, uh, and, and, and then we're going to spend some time in prayer. Uh, the first thing I would say is this. It's essential because it is for the time in which you live. God wants to give us this hope in this particular time in which we live. When, um, when the Spirit fell, fell at Pentecost, obviously because of the, um, the phenomena that was going on, many in Jerusalem began to gather around to see what was happening. And um, Peter gets up and he begins to share with them what all this means. And the first thing that Peter does when he gets up, he quotes Joel 2, 28 through 32. Now, I always wondered, why did Peter have that verse in his back pocket to pull out at Pentecost and immediately quote it to the people? And I believe the reason he had it there was because less than two weeks earlier, Jesus was teaching them on this verse. Jesus was speaking. This is the promise of the Father that Jesus spoke about in Acts 1. He told him, you wait for the promise of the Father in Jerusalem. You see, this prophecy out of Joel is a prophecy, is a promise of the Father given, given thousands of years ago. And it's a prophecy in which God says, I'm going to do some things for you in the last days. So when are the last days? The last days are the days between the ascension of Jesus and His return. And I believe that's why Jesus was teaching them on this, because He knew His ascension was imminent, and they were about to be thrusted into the last days. And so Jesus was saying to them, these promises are for you in the last days. And in that prophecy, God speaks of three things that are going to be happening in the last days. And I want us to just quickly look at those uh, three characteristics of the last days. And uh, I want to look at them in reverse order. Now remember, this passage in Acts is basically a quote of Joel's prophecy. And so uh, we'll look at the last part of the prophecy, which is in Acts 2.21. And there it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, when it says everyone, what, I'm, what I see there is that God is speaking through Joel and saying, people out of every nation, every tribe, every people group who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. As a matter of fact, Jesus is making reference to this when he told the disciples that the Holy Spirit's coming on them, and he prophesies, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. So in the last days, one of the things that is going to happen is that people from every group, every tribe, every nation will be calling upon the name of the Lord. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Alan was telling us about a conference he went out to in California, finished the task, I think was the name of it, wasn't Alan? And that some of the leaders of the missionary groups that were there said that they feel like it's possible to see the task fulfilled by what year? By 2033. By 2033. We could be that close <laughs> to seeing this fulfilled. So, a Bible in every language by 2028. 
We're living in the last days, and we're living in the fulfillment of these prophecies. The second thing uh, is in kind of the middle portion of the, um, of the prophecy of Joel, in which God says, In the last days I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. So what God is saying here in this prophecy is that these last days will conclude with a massive cataclysmic upheaval in the earth before the blessed hope comes, right before the blessed hope comes. And so if we're moving toward the blessed hope, uh, these prophecies that we see not only here but in Revelation uh, are, are, to, are to be expected in terms of the upheavals in the earth. But the third part of the prophecy, which is the fir- really the first, pro- first part of the prophecy, but the fir- third characteristic I want to look at is obviously in Acts 2, 17 through 18. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Now hear what Peter is saying in using this uh, particular prophecy. He's saying to the people of Jerusalem that in the last days there will be continuous outpouring of the Spirit throughout the last days. Please understand Pentecost was not a one-time event to jumpstart the church. Pentecost is the promise of God throughout the last days. And that we are called into this hope before the blessed hope. We as believers are called to seek for and believe God for this work of the Spirit in our lives as individuals, in fullness in the life of our church, in revival. And I know a lot's going on with the Methodist church splitting, but I I pray to God that the church that splits off, whatever it is, will be born in revival and not just another institution because that's what birthed the Methodist church to begin with. We need to be churches of revival and Believing God, seeking God, believing God for awakening, and that's why we've gathered here to, to, to seek God for another awakening. I remember Dr. Kenlaw used to always say, uh, you know, God's brought the United States two great awakenings, and we need to pray for an, that He would make another run through the United States. And we do, we need it at this time, a third great awakening. So, to refuse to go after this hope before the blessed hope, this Holy Spirit coming on you, power. A lot of people are not, and there's usually several reasons. One reason is fear. Fear of what it might look like or fear of what it might cost. And believe me, it costs you. It will cost us. If we're praying for awakening, we need to understand what it will cost us. If we're praying for fullness, it will cost us. That's one reason we don't seek after this. We don't seek it. We don't live in it because of what it might cost. A lot of times it's because of arrogance. We somehow believe that we can fulfill the will of God in these last days without Holy Spirit power. We can't. This is the hope before the blessed hope. Jesus is saying you need this in the last days. This is what I'm giving you in these times in which you're living. And the third reason is because of doubt. We just don't believe God can do this. We don't believe He can bring an awakening. We don't believe He can bring revival. We're not giving ourselves to faith in that. Maybe some of you don't believe He can fill you with the Holy Spirit. You know, in the last century, the dominance of Christianity moved from... uh, the northern hemisphere to the south, 
global south. And I believe the main reason for that is that the primary expression of church life were churches going after Holy Spirit coming on you power. Whether it was holiness churches, Pentecostal churches, denominational churches, as they were going after this, you began to see God moving and God working. They were going after not only Holy Spirit coming on you power personally, but for the churches and even for their nations. <laughs> I read in one book, a Catholic said, if a Catholic leaves the Catholic church in North America, he becomes a secularist because that's the dominant form of Christianity, dominant form of religion in, in the United States. He said if he leaves the Catholic Church in Latin America, he becomes a Pentecostal. <laughs> Holy Spirit coming on you, power needs to be the dominant expression of our churches and the dominant expression, dominant expression of our lives. And in that way, we can see it as an expression in our nation. Are, are we going after this hope before the blessed hope, and are we seeking to live in that fullness that God has for us? As individuals and as churches, are we going after Holy Spirit coming on your power? Now, the second reason why it's so crucial we go after it is because it's crucial to Jesus. It's important to Jesus. Peter, continuing to talk to the people about what's going on and quoting Joel's prophecy, he then begins to tell them about a man who was stirring up a lot of attention in Jerusalem that many of them knew about. Of course, he's talking about Jesus of Nazareth. And listen to what Peter says about Jesus. Uh, I'm just going to quickly run through this. Acts 2, and basically what Peter is saying to these people, look, Jesus is the divine Messiah. He is the divine Messiah. And He's Lord. He's Lord now of heaven and earth. And so in Acts 2.22, he says, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did among you through Him as you yourself know. So he says, you know, even in his very ministry, it was, a, it was an expression of who he is as Messiah, divine Messiah. Acts 2, 23. This man healed, handed, was handed over to you by God's set purposes and foreknowledge. Handed over to you by God's set purposes and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. There were some people in that crowd that were part of the crowd that was crying out for him to be crucified. But this is true of all of us. We put him on the cross. And here he's expressing, again, another prophecy of Messiah in Isaiah 53. Acts 2, 24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. It, this man <laughs> is no longer in the grave. Death could not hold him. As a matter of fact, he was resurrected into a new creation body before, before the new creation. <laughs> he's ready for it. And he's the one who will resurrect us into these new creation bodies. Acts 2. 33, exalted to the right hand of God. His, his, uh, here he's talking about his authority over heaven and earth. He's now ascended into heaven in a position of authority and power over all things. Lord of heaven and earth. But then Peter wraps up this quick survey of Jesus. And this is kind of his punchline, Acts 2.33. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. In other words, Peter's saying, to prove what I'm saying is true, you need to know that Jesus in heaven is the one who's pouring out the Holy Spirit as divine Messiah upon us right now. 
He is the one who is fulfilling the promise that God gave through Joel. He's pouring out his spirit upon his people. Now, Jesus pouring out the spirit is really one of the first things he does from heaven for his people. It says to me that this was pretty important to Jesus. I mean, think about it. One of the first things he does, 10 days after he's ascended to the heaven, he pours out his spirit upon the disciples. Why is it not important to us? A dear friend of mine, Rich Stevenson, who was uh, an evangelist with FAS for a while, Rich would always say that there are a lot of people in the church who see the Holy Spirit as the weird uncle of the Trinity. And uh, I don't know if you had a weird uncle. My grandfather's brother was a bit weird. And Uncle John, I remember he would come we, at Indian Springs. He'd kind of always show up. And uh, he would do little tricks and tell funny stories. But you didn't want to leave Uncle John in charge of anything. And a lot of people look at the Holy Spirit that way. You know, he's nice to have around, does some unusual things. But you don't want to leave him in charge of anything. Is that what Jesus said? I mean, you look at Acts, excuse me, John 16, 7. Jesus doesn't say to the disciples, well, guys, I've got to go to heaven. All I can do is leave you Uncle Holy Ghost. And, uh, uh, but, but don't give him the keys to the church. You know? <laughs> no, Jesus said, it's for your good that I go to the Father so that I can send the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, uh, one theologian has said this. He he, He says, instead of saying that the Holy Spirit is uncle, the the weird uncle of the Trinity, he says the Holy Spirit is the shy member of the Trinity. Why? Because he's always deferring to Jesus. That's the nature of the Trinity, deferring to one another in love. If without the Holy Spirit, we couldn't be born again. We're born again of the Spirit. <laughs> He's the one who ministers into our life the very presence of Jesus so that we can be in Christ and Christ can be in us. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to live out this life in Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one And to me, this is an amazing thing. Who infuses into us the love of God. You know, in Romans it says, the Spirit pours out the love of the Father. Now, I believe that love of the Father is His love for us, but I'll tell you something else. The Father loves the Son. And I'm convinced that the love that the Spirit pours out from the Father is the very love of the Father for the Son. That's what Jesus says in John 17, in His prayer. He says, Father, the love that You have for me, would You put that in them? Would You give them that kind of passionate devotion toward me that You have toward me? The Holy Spirit is always deferring us toward Jesus in His work within our life. That's why when, when Wesley said, looked at this whole issue of spiritfulness, he says it's to bring about this perfect love, this ex- infusion of God's love into our life, to be expressed through our life. Seek to receive and live in this hope before the blessed hope. We need, to, we need to ask God, Lord, help me to go after this and to live in this for myself, for my church, for our nation. To believe you for, for what you want to do in this hour through your spirit. And the third thing I, I would say is this, that... Um, 
the blessed hope is crucial for us. The, the hope before the blessed hope is crucial for us. Holy Spirit coming on you power. Because it's the fullness of our salvation. Um, that's why we need to go after. You know, with the crowd, when Peter made his case that Jesus is the Messiah, their response is, what can we do? In other words, what have we done? <laughs> We're part of, of putting the Messiah on the cross. What can we do now? And so Jesus, uh, Peter tells them this in Acts 2.38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I'm convinced that the early church saw salvation as a number of workings that God does in our life. He moves us toward repentance of sin and receiving the forgiveness of sins, baptism in the name of Jesus, and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Receiving the full work of the Holy Spirit. This was so important to the early church in terms of the disciples seeing Holy Spirit coming on you power as essential to the early church. That when Philip went to Samaria and the believers there believed in Jesus and were baptized, they had repented. But they heard they had not received the Holy Spirit. And so Jerusalem sends down a delegation of Peter and John to bring them into the fullness of the Holy Spirit because that was important. It was an important part of our life in Jesus to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When Paul in Acts 19 goes to Ephesus and he finds a group of believers there that have believed in Jesus because Apollos taught accurately about Jesus, they believed in Jesus. They understood everything about Jesus, but they had not been baptized in the name of Jesus. Neither had they received the Holy Spirit. Because Paul asked them right out front, did you receive the Holy Spirit after you believed? And they said, no, we didn't know that was a, a possibility. We don't know anything about that. And so Paul leads them into fullness. And look at this. If you read Acts 19, it not only brought fullness to those believers, it brought revival to that little group of believers and it brought an awakening in Ephesus that rocked the city. Because of the power of Holy Spirit coming on you power. The hope before the blessed hope. The hope that God has given us in these last days before, his, before the return of Jesus. Let me just kind of close with this chapter, which, um, with this verse, which has really haunted me. In the book of Hebrews, back in, yeah, excuse me, in the book of Hebrews, thank you, David. Um, the Hebrew writer is talking about some believers that are falling away from the faith, but in the process, he's kind of defining certain realities of the, of the life of a believer. And one of the phrases he uses is this. They have tasted of the power of the coming age. They have tasted of the power of the coming age. Do you understand what they're saying in that? <laughs> that we are tasting of the power of through Holy Spirit coming on through power, you are tasting of the power that Jesus will unleash when He resurrects us from the dead, when He redeems all things, when He brings heaven and earth together into a new creation. We are tasting of that power. You see, the hope before the blessed hope, Holy Spirit coming on you power is not just the hope before the blessed hope, it's a taste of the blessed hope. And I'm convinced that revival and awakening is the closest thing we can know of the coming age before the return of Jesus. We are tasting of the power of the coming age. 
And that's why, friends, <laughs> awakening can only happen by God bringing it and us crying out to Him for awakening and us crying out to Him for fullness and crying out for revival in our lives, in our churches. In the Orthodox tradition, there is a, a great picture that I've always appreciated, and that is this. They would say, you know, the nature of a sword is that it's hard, it's cold, and it cuts. But if you take that sword and if you leave it in a fire long enough, it changes the nature of the sword. So that now it's soft, it's red hot, and it can ignite fires. The very fire changes the nature of the fire. And that's why we need fullness and our church needs fullness. We need revival. And our, and our nation needs awakening because it's the fire of the Spirit that changes the very nature of who we are and what's going on. Uh, tonight, I, I thought it might be good to do this uh, as a way of uh, closing out. I would like for you, uh, uh, in a minute we're going to just uh, pray, but I'm going to ask for you to stand for one of three categories, or you can stand for all three categories, if you really feel led to. And then I'm going to call on one of our team members uh, to pray for those that are standing. Um, so here, here's what I want to ask you to stand for. If you say, first of all, Mark, I'm not sure I have sought for or gone for fullness of the Holy Spirit in my own life, and I recognize I need I need the fullness. I need the, I need the hope before the blessed hope because Jesus wants me to have it and because it's what's needed in the times in which we live and because it is the fullness of our salvation. Then I just want you to stand where you are and, and in a minute. And it might be some of you saying, you know, I, I need renewal in that. I, there was a time in my life, but I've kind of... Uh, I'm not living in it like I should be living in fullness. And then the second is this. Those of you who would like to stand in terms of saying, I, I want to pray and I want to go after and seek for revival in the church. Folks, our churches need revival. They need revival. And, um, and maybe that's the calling God has on you. Or it could be, and I, I heard this shared as we went around, and that's why we're here in terms of awakening, that we would like to see this massive display of Holy Spirit coming on you power over our nation. And uh, if you read in history, and, uh, you'll find that folks who were believing for revival, believing for awakening, they gave themselves to pray and to pray and others to pray as a way of seeking God and believing God for that. So those are the three categories. And uh, you, as you are listening to the Holy Spirit, wherever you sense the Lord leading you, then you just stand for that particular area. Let's, let's bow our heads in prayer and Lord, we, in these days together, we want to hear from you and give ourselves to what you're calling us into in this hour. And so, Lord, I, I pray right now as we, as we demonstrate what we're hearing you say to us, that you give us grace, Lord, to make a stand. And uh, we welcome you here right now, Holy Spirit. Just, just come and settle in upon us. We love you. We love the way you work in our lives. Sweet Jesus, work now through your spirit.